Peace that we have been that we have been in for the last few weeks, living the life that God that you are called to live. And we've looked at that. Are we living the life that God has called us to live? He calls us to live a worthy life, a life that is in balance with the price He's paid for us, a life that is in balance of His call on us, what He's, what he's called us to. That's the balance of our lives. And then we've been looking at in Philippians 3, 12 through 16, actually 10 through 16. In this passage, Paul talks about the things that will help us to live a worthy life, the things that will help us to live the life, the lives that God has called us to live. It's in His Word. It's in His Word. And we've looked at these various things. And so we look, we'll go to the next slide. Christ Jesus has taken hold of us. He has grabbed you. He's grabbed you really strongly, really with a powerful grip. And what is our response? Have we in turn grabbed hold of Him? Jesus will never do all of this work in our lives by Himself. That is not the way that God does it. That's not how God works. He works with us. And when we say, help me, He helps us. And when we say, change me, He changes us. And when he say, we say yes to Him, He says, okay, now let me work with you. He grabs us and then we grab Him. And as we do that, as we do that, the plans that God has for us, they are worked out in our lives. We fulfill the purpose for which God has called us, all the various things that God has for us. Those pictures that we saw just a few minutes ago, all of these things, you know, you, you look and, and you think, wow, way up there in the northernmost tip of the Philippines on the top of a mountain, here are these people living in, in, in with so little, living with dirt floors and, and a few boards, and they call that and they call that a house or a wall. And yet in that place, there are people that have been called of God that are living the lives that God has called them to live. There are people who have been bought by the blood of the Lamb who are going to go to heaven and not to hell, whose lives will never be the same because Jesus has come into their lives, because Vivian said yes to God, because you have prayed and because you have given. This is part of living the life that God has called you to live. So we look this morning as we come to the end of our time to get together. What was the first thing we looked at? The first point, what does Paul say? Dissatisfaction. So the first thing, he says, I haven't made it yet. And I think, you know, Paul was a really good writer and he was inspired of the Lord. So he never wastes words and he never uh, uses illustrations. Just, oh, by the way, I think I'll use this. It was all inspired of the Lord. And Paul, in this short passage, two times says, I haven't made it yet. So that encourages me. And I think maybe Paul probably, Perhaps Paul had to say it two times because people had to be convinced. I mean, would you think that Paul had really attained full maturity? It's Paul, after all, right? Wouldn't you think so? He'd started how many churches? He, he was in prison as he, as he writes this. If I were looking at Paul, I would say, Paul has made it. But Paul tells everyone, I haven't made it yet. I haven't made it yet. Why would Paul say that? When you and I would look at the life of Paul and we would say in looking at his life, in looking at his sacrifice, in looking at his work for God, in looking at what he would, had given up and looking at what he was doing, I would say, wow, Paul, you've made it. But Paul said, I haven't made it yet. I still, I'm not all, I, I haven't fully attained. Why does Paul say that? Because he has a poor self-image? No! It has nothing to do with poor self-image. has nothing to do with psychology. Paul could say that. And he said it twice, I think, to make sure people really understood. Why? Because Paul was looking ahead and Paul had a glimpse and Paul had a vision of what God had for him. Paul had seen the goal. Paul had seen the finish line. Paul had seen the full 
purposes of God in his life. And so he knew that's yet ahead and I'm not there yet. And brothers and sisters, that's something that you and I have to do as well. Because as we're talking about these things, dissatisfaction and devotion and all of these things, if we only see the process of our lives, stay with me now, if we only see the process of our lives, this is how I do it, if you will. This is how I make it. If all we see is the process. If all our focus and all our energy is on, this is how I have to do. We will grow so discouraged. It will be too hard. It will be, we will want to give up because when all you see is the process, when all I see is this is how I've got to do it, after a while, it just gets hard, doesn't it? It gets discouraging. It gets long. It, it gets. <sighs> I don't even know the word to say for it, but it's just like, I'm running and all I'm doing is running. You and I, uh, you may need to turn off your phones if your phones are on. Just double check your phones real quickly so we don't get disturbed as we get into the message. Um, I sometimes have to check my phone as well. You and I are going to have to see what Paul saw. You and I are going to have to understand what Paul understood. And Paul begins this whole passage by saying, I want to know Christ. And he talks about how he wants to know him. And so Paul sees the end. Paul sees the goal. Paul understands the finish line. Paul sees the whole thing. He doesn't see every everything because God's always surprising us, isn't he? God's always bigger than we know and he's more than we know. But Paul saw enough to know that's where I'm going. Paul said, what does he say a little bit later? We'll read it just a little. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So he understands to some extent of wh why Jesus grabbed hold of him, some of those purposes. A little bit later he says, for the prize of the high calling. And you and I, as we walk with the Lord in this, wor in this world, in all the time that we have here, long or short, and some of us this morning, because we live in a sinful, broken world, our time here may be shorter than, it, than others. It may be cut short by by who knows or whatever. Some, some of us, it will be a long life should the Lord tarry, but maybe He's not going to tarry. Whatever time we have, whatever time we have, if we see, God, this is what you've called for more, we will fulfill the purposes that God has for our lives because we see the goal. Following the process, brothers and sisters, it's not enough. Although we're looking at the process, the process will get us to the goal, but the process is not enough. We've got to see the prize. We've got to see the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We've got to understand, God, this is why you've called me. And when we see that, then we can stick with the process. When we see that, then we can say, yes, I am going to walk this road. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to do it. Why? Because I see the end and I see the goal. That's how we're going to make it, brothers and sisters. That's how we're going to make it. You and I will only make it so far with our determination. I must. I'm going to. That, that is a joyless, that is a joyless Christian life. That is a, a hard Christian life. And there are things at times that aren't very pleasant. And there are things at times that are not very easy. But brothers and sisters, when you see the end, when you see Jesus, when you understand why you're running, there is joy in the process. There is strength in the process. There is inspiration and there is encouragement in the process. So get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the goal. Get your eyes on the prize. Understand why Jesus has grabbed hold of you and why you grab hold of him. And it will be a lot easier to run this race. It will be a lot easier to go through the process. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so the first one is dissatisfaction. And it's not low self-image. It is not, I'm such a bad person and I'm such a bad Christian, but it is a dissatisfaction that comes from God that will push us onward. It will keep us going. It will keep us going because we will understand, God, you've got something for me, more for me, and so I'm not satisfied with this. You've got something more. I want more. Lord, I've, I've tasted, what, what, does, what does the writer say? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How many of you, you go to a really great restaurant or even not a great restaurant. Anyhow, you go to a restaurant and you order something and you get the first bite and it's good. Yeah? Can you think of something you've eaten? Yeah. Me, yeah. 
young, young men always say, this. yeah. <laughs> and you taste it. Let me ask you this, just in the natural, are you satisfied with that one bite? Oh, that, you, put, you get that one bite and you put your fork down, you say, mmm, that sure was good. Check. How many of us do that? Nobody does that. You've got the first bite, what does that first bite want? make you want to do? Second bite. Third bite, until you've had it all. And the writer says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Brothers and sisters, the glimpse of God, the glimpse of the goal line, the glimpse of Jesus, and the prize for which he's calling us, heavenward in Christ Jesus, it's a taste. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we have blessings of God now. We have good things of God now. But you know what? God has more in store for us. God has greater in store. God has better in store. So don't stop where you are. Don't be satisfied where you are. There's more in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So a question to ask ourselves this morning, every one of us, am I good enough? Am I good enough? And I put the question this way. That doesn't sound very good, does it? doesn't sound very spiritual. Because a lot of times, we look at our own Christian lives and we judge it by, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm doing quite well. I've really gone a long way. I'm better than most people. I'm serving the Lord. I'm not involved in sin. And I'm coming to church and I'm giving my tithes and all these things. And sometimes we get the feeling, I'm, I'm good enough. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. But if we feel, well, I'm good enough, then we're in danger, we're in danger of missing the mark because He has more for us. Let the Holy Spirit, He lives in you, listen, the Holy Spirit lives in you. One of His purposes is to work in you and to work out of you the purposes of God for your life. That's one of His jobs. That's His description. That's one of the things he has come to do. And if you will let him, he will create in you a holy dissatisfaction, a hunger for more of God and more that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. What was the second thing? And we are, by the way, we are going to finish this morning. I promise. We did in the first service, so we have to in the second. We're going to in the second as well. What's the second one? Second one is devotion. That one focus, that one, that one thing. The one thing that we that we uh, uh, that we get our that we get our eyes on, and when we have the focus, when we have the devotion, everything else will fit into place. All the other parts of our lives will get in its they'll get in their right positions and their right priorities. And then that means when we have we have that devotion, that means the things that we want now, the things that are pleasant to us now, all of these other things, they will get the right priority. You see, some of the things that we want now really press our hearts, don't they? We feel some things like, I really want this. I really want to accomplish this. And sometimes things that we want now can fill our lives and we get out of balance and we, we, because we don't have the right priorities since we get out of balance. And what we want most gets lost in what we want from, in the midst of what we want now. Yeah? So the question we ask ourselves as we think about the one thing, am I giving up what I want most for what I want now? That's a question I've been praying this week. And that's a, that's a good, that's, for me, that's a good way to put it. When we come to the end of our message this morning, I want you to remember this, because we're going to come back to Eric Little this morning, that great runner and missionary for the Lord. Um, we're going to come back to that, so remember that. But when we know, you see, when you know what you want most, when you know what the prize is, when you know Jesus, when you know what His purposes are for you, and you really understand it, then ev everything else, you'll know, Lord, you are what I want most. What does Paul say? Philippians 3.10 I want to know Christ in all of these dimensions. And because of that, all his other priorities, they were in the right place. Amen? And so that's a question that we ask ourselves. So number one, dissatisfaction. Number two, devotion. And then last week, what did we look at? Last week we looked at direction. Direction. Which, which way are you leaning? Which way are you leaning? Which way are you pushing? Which way are you pressing? And so we looked at direction. And Paul says, forgetting the past and straining towards what is ahead. And that has all to do with direction. 
That has all to do with direction. And so a question for us as we consider direction is what? The question that we consider is how much of my time, my thoughts, and my feelings are directed toward the past? How much? How much does it fill your heart and life? And it may be good things of the past, and it may be hard things of the past. It may be things that, oh, yo, oh, back in the day, oh, it was so wonderful. And I love reading because of, because God is so good. I love reading testimonies. I love reading about the great revivals of the past, don't you? I really do. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Azusa Street um, in, in the U.S. In the, in the early 1900s, or the great revival in Wales. And some of you are saying, what? Go back and find out about these things. It's wonderful. But brothers and sisters, God is not just the God of the past. He's the God of the present and the future. And in your heart and in my heart, what should be filling our hearts and what should be pulling us direction is God what you still have for me. You know, I, let me speak a word to some of you here this morning. Some of you have at times in your life been so close to the Lord and your heart has been so full of joy and you served the Lord with gladness and zeal and there was a freshness and there was a life in your light. And for some of you, you have sort of come to the place where it's been so long and you haven't felt a fresh touch from the Lord and you've just kind of settled down and you, you, you look back really with, with um, maybe with nostalgia because of how it used to be, you know, back then. I want to encourage you this morning. Let God refresh your life. Let God bring again an expectation. I love that verse. In, in, it's in Psalms, and I can't remember the reference right now, but I, I, I quote it all along. Let your expectation be from the Lord. It's, it's from the Psalms, I believe. Let your expectation be from the Lord. Oh, God is your God in the future as well. And let your direction lean forward. Bible scholars don't completely agree on this passage. Some say that Paul was speaking of a, of a foot race, a running, a, a running, a foot race, okay, a marathon or something like that. Um, and so it says the direction to be leaning forward. How many of you, at least in running, have you ever seen a runner, especially near the end, have you ever seen a runner running like this? <laughs> no! What does every runner do, especially as the end gets nearer? What's every runner doing? <laughs> leaning forward, leaning forward towards the end line. So some scholars say that Paul was talking about um, a foot race, and that would certainly make sense. And the Philippians 3.13, where, where, here where it says, straining toward what is ahead, in the Greek, what it means is stretching as in a race. Stretching is in a race. And I think all of us have seen pictures of, of right near the finish line where somebody will be in head just a little bit, but one of the other runners will stretch and they'll be in front at the end. Of course, in this race we can all win, so that's an imperfect analogy. Um, so some Bible scholars say that that's what it means. But other scholars say that Paul was all, could have been talking about a chariot race, which was also very, uh, very popular at that time. And the chariot race, the horses would be out in front, and the chariot itself would be the, just a, just two wheels, and the chariot platform was a very, very small platform, and the and the chariot driver in the race was standing up on that platform, and he had to balance, and to really balance on the platform and to really make it. You know, and to control the horses that were out in front, the, the chariot driver had to stretch out and lean out over the platform over to hold the reins on the horses so that he could control them. And so the only way to be successful in that race was really to get out there and to really stretch yourself out. And so that analogy or that picture fits very, very well here um, as well if we think about it that way. If he didn't, it was disaster. If he didn't, the horses couldn't be controlled and the chariot would go off and there would, there would be a wreck. Whichever one Paul is referring to, it's still the same picture for you and me. Stretch forward. Stretch forward, lean forward. Are there things in your life that are still filling your heart from the past? They just they take up they take up time, they take up space, they take up heart, they take up feeling, they take up energy, they they take up time, and they're still filling your heart. 
if they are brothers and sisters, take it to Jesus. Take it to the cross and say, God, as I told you last week, Lord, here it is. I don't want it in my heart. I don't want it to keep sapping my energy, just draining my energy. Lord, take care of it. Take care of it. Lord, you deal with it. Let it go and let God take it. Is it easy? It's not always easy because brothers and sisters, when you and I let things stay in our hearts from the past and have not been resolved, what happens? They grow roots in our lives, don't they? They grow roots and those roots go down deep and they don't want to let go. It's not worth it because if it's in your heart and it's grown roots, it's going to keep on growing roots and the roots are going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Go to God and say, God, I don't want this in my life. Get it out. Get it out. Lord, you take care of it. Whatever it is, whatever it is, let it go and let the direction of your life be leaning forward so that your life will be fully fulfilled and so that the purposes that God has for you, it won't be wasted. It won't, it won't be less than what it was. I've told you before, one of the prayers I pray is this, God fulfill your purposes in my life. That's one of my prayers. That is one of my constant prayers. God, what do you have for me? Some things I know. Some things God's revealing as I go along and God does that. He does both. God will show you some things. You know some things. But you keep on walking with Him and He will reveal more things that He has for you in all sorts of areas. God, fulfill your purposes for my life. I do not want to stand before Him one day and find out and see all of the things that weren't fulfilled, that weren't accomplished, that weren't done in my life or through my life. And they could have been. I don't want that for my life. And I pray and I hope you don't want that for your life either. Now there's some things in the past, can't change that. But I tell you what, from this point onward, I can lean forward. I can lean forward and His purposes can be fulfilled in my life as they are in yours. So there's the third one for us, so direction. Let's go a little bit further. We look, what's the next one? We find it in Philippians 3.14. What's the next point? He says, I haven't achieved it, but, and there were three things that we've, that we've highlighted here. He says, I press on to take hold. We've seen that one. Verse 13, I forget the past and I strain towards what is ahead. And verse 14 again, I press on. I press on. And these words here, this pressing on and this pressing on. Straining toward is stretching as in a race. Pressing on, in the Greek, these were, this expression has to do, it's the idea of a hunter chasing his prey and not giving up until he gets his prey, until he finds his prey. So it's a hunter hunting. And so when we look at this, this is our fourth point. What is he talking about? He's talking about determination. Determination. I'm going to press on. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to give up. Even if I get, dis get discouraged, I'm not going to say, oh well, I am going to press on. Why? Why do we press on? Why do we press on? Because I don't know about you, I sometimes get tired of pressing on. How many of you, sometimes you're tired of pressing on? Yes? <sighs> Let me just coast for a while. Let me just kind of put it in uh, auto drive. Now, what's it called? Cruise control. That's it. Cru cruise control. Um, and, and so I don't have to pay so much attention. Let me just kind of coast for a while. Paul says, I press on. I press on. Why? Because he'd seen the goal. He'd seen the goal. That's how we've got to see Jesus. That's why we've got to understand, God, this is why you've grabbed hold of me. Now, I want to talk about this determination. It is not just myself, because some of us have strong personalities, right? How many of you, looking at yourself, how many of you would say, I'm a determined person? You, it, raise your hand. You, you, you would say, of yourself, I'm a determined person. I believe so, okay? Yes. 
And there are great qualities in determination. I'm a determined person. But I want to tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. Those of you that sit here and say, I'm not really a very determined person. This is not talking about the natural. This is a spiritual quality. This is a spiritual dimension that goes beyond the natural. Because in our natural, we can say, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. That's, that's effort that comes from the flesh and it can't do anything in the spirit. It can't do anything in the spirit. Only God can work in that realm. And so it's a spiritual dimension that we go beyond that. And so he says, I press toward the goal to win the prize. Now I have an earthly example for you. Let's look at the picture. As I was preparing, I was reading about this. I'd seen the pictures. I was so encouraged. I don't know about you, but uh, in the natural, we would look at that and we would say, huh, that's not a very good, uh, Pastor Jennifer, you chose the wrong picture to encourage us. This person is not even running. They have fallen down and they're crawling. So, what, so where is the victory in that? And I chose this, one, this picture just as a reminder for us. This is, a, this is one of the elite uh, marathon runners from Kenya. This was a few years ago. And she had reached near the finish line. And some of you may have remembered, remembered you may remember seeing this on, on the news. She had reached, she was very close near the finish line. It was a marathon, so it was 26 miles, right? 26 miles, isn't that right? Marathon's 26. Or kilometers, how many? 42 kilometers. <laughs> I will never be a marathon runner. I am so thankful the Lord has called me to be a preacher rather than a marathon runner. Um, if I hit about two miles, that's about all I can do. That's about all I can do. And, but this is a natural example. But I was so encouraged. I thought, Lord, that describes, that describes what you're talking to us about in the spiritual. She'd reached almost the end of the race and she collapsed. She just rest. She couldn't go any further. And she, was, she had run marathons before. And they brought a wheelchair out onto the track to take her off the track. And she sat down in the wheelchair. And then she got out of the wheelchair, pushed the wheelchair back, and crawled to the finish line. Crawled to the finish line. Now you and I might say, but she didn't win. Do you think she won that race? There were lots of others that were faster than she, right? But I love the example that we see in the physical that helps us to understand the spiritual. I was looking at that and I thought, the only thing she's looking at is the goal, is the end line. And she crawled to the end and she made it across. She made it to the end. Brothers and sisters, there will be times in your Christian life when you may feel I am on my hands and my knees and I'm crawling. Where's the victory in that? Where's the overcoming in that? You keep on. You don't give up. Because the determination that you and I have in the Lord is going to get us to the end. Now I want to say something here just a minute. In fact, some of you may have been looking at me as we reach the end of the praise and worship time this morning as I was praying and as we were singing the Lord brought some things to our mind so I added some notes as I was as I was sitting there this morning and and the Holy Spirit was just speaking to my heart and one of the things that he spoke to me was if we as I said if we only see the process and we don't see the end it's going to be very hard to make it that's one of the things but one of the other things that he spoke to me is this for every point in this he is our provision he's our provision so if we're going to have the determin de determination to make it, it's not going to come just completely out of ourselves. I'm determined to make it! <sighs> A lot of people say that and they fall by the wayside. The provision that we need for this race, the provision that we need to fulfill God's purposes and live the life He has called us to live will come from Him. It will come from Him. It will be a response from us, but it's going to have to come from Him. That holy dissatisfaction, that first one, it's going to have to come from God. We, ha we have a part to play, but it has to come from Him. That devotion and that single focus, only God, only God can give me that. Only God can give me that. And only He can give you that. That direction, that pulling forward, God's going to have to do that in my life. This determination, He's going to have to put it in my life. And so as we look at this, it's not just all about us. We hold on to Him? Yes, we do. But He has first held 
on to us. Remember what 2 Peter in the first chapter, it says, He has given us all we need for life and godliness. That's 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 or 5, right around there. All that we need, all that we need. And where do we find and where do we receive all that we need? Let me keep it in terms of this that we're speaking, that we're speaking of this morning. We find it as we hold on to Him. As simple as that. He's holding on to us. We hold on to Him. And as we hold on to Him, there is a divine exchange. Our satisfaction for the holy dissatisfaction that He will give us. Our singleness of, of gaze and devotion that He will give us for all of the things that we're looking at. The determination and the direction. There will be an exchange and God will give us of Himself that we might run the race and that we might live the lives He's called us to live. So what's a question that we have for ourselves? And this is the question, an evaluation question for you this morning, as it is for me. And I know it's a little bit low, so let me read it. Have I gradually given up on some things because I've gotten comfortable or discouraged? Okay, so indetermination. And the reason I think the Lord put this question on my, let me say it, read it again. Have I gradually given up on some things because I've gotten comfortable or discouraged? And the reason I put the question this way as we think about determination is this. I seldom meet Christians who are serving the Lord and then, boom, suddenly one day they decide, forget it, I'm giving up on God. I, I seldom meet Christians like that. But what I do meet are Christians, they've been serving the Lord and they've been going on and they've kind of lost sight of God and they've like kind of lost sight of the goal and the joy is gone from their lives and because they don't see the end anymore, there's no joy in the process. And there's very little strength in the process and they just gradually just kind of settle back and they just gradually kind of let go of some things. And so my question to you this morning is, have you gradually sort of let go of some things that you need to start holding on to again, that you need to get back in line with? I know that that is true in my life and I suspect it's true in your life as well. So determination, determination. And then we come to the very last one this morning and we see what it says this is in the last part he says we forget we've read all of this part he says God has called me heavenward the prize which is heavenward it's in Christ Jesus and I love that because you know what God Jesus is our is our strength Jesus is our goal Jesus is our coach Jesus is our la la tue <laughs> Those of you who say, what is a la la doy? What is it? Cheerleader. Cheerleader. He's our cheerleader, if you will. I'm not being disrespectful of Jesus. I'm not. Because he encourages us. He encourages. He is our, he is our everything. And he's the goal and he's the end. All the way through. He is all of these things to us. The Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. He's in us, giving us the power to do, of the, do this, all of this. And so he says, here it is. He's called me heavenward word in Christ Jesus. And then he says, verse 15, all of us who are spiritually mature should take such a view of these things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. And that really speaks to me because sometimes we break fellowship with other Christians who don't think exactly the way we think, right? You don't think just like I think. Now, Paul is not talking about heresy and false teaching here. But Paul is talking about people that are in varying degrees of maturity and understanding. And he just leaves it. And he doesn't say, you're a bad Christian. He just says, you live up to what you know. And as you go further along, God will make it clear to you. God help us to take such a view with true brothers and sisters in the faith that are at different levels of understanding. Keep on walking with God. They're a brother in Christ. They're a sister in Christ. They have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. They're going to make it to heaven. They're going to make it to heaven. What are you going to do? You're going to break fellowship now? just because you kind of look differently at some things. Again, I'm not talking about false teaching and I'm not talking about heresy. That's, that's very different. But I'm talking about people, as we come to the Word of God, we say, well, I, I don't, this part, I, I think this way, or I, I, I think that way. And Paul says, Paul says, God will make it clear to you, but this is what he says. He says, only let us live up to what we've already attained. What is Paul talking about in this last part? We come to the last one. 
we're talking about the discipline of the Christian life. There is a discipline and a training and a correction in your life and my life if we're going to make it to the end, if we're going to live the lives that God has called us to live. There must be. There must be. You and I will not float our way into heaven. We will not. There's going to be a discipline. There's a training of our lives. And Paul says, live up to what you know. Live up to what you know. Don't go back. And then he gives us some other verses. Let's look at these two other verses. In 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27, what does he say? All athletes are disciplined in their training. I, I remember reading... Um, it was a concert pianist, or it was somebody, I don't think it was, or it may have been Yo-Yo Ma, I can't, you know, the, the, the wonderful uh, cellist. It was Yo-Yo Ma or, or someone else. And he talked about his training, but I think it was, I think it was a, a concert pianist. And I remember reading this, and it really, it, it really struck me. And I thought, this is at this level, and he said, if I don't practice, and he would practice like four to six, six to eight hours per day, per day. And this was a concert pianist. He said, if I miss one day of practice, he said, I can tell the difference. Maybe nobody else can. And let me ask you something. Aren't there times in your life and mine when we've let go of the discipline and outside everything looks okay? Yeah? yeah. But inside, yeah. you and I know. We know, don't we? We know, Lord, I'm not, I can, I can fool everyone else, but inside I know there's a lessening of affection. There's a coldness of heart. There's a, there's a lack of zeal, but I'm not letting anybody else know. The pianist said, if I miss two days of practice, the critics can tell. Those that are trained, those that know. And a lot of times, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, pastors, because God has given us that responsibility, we can tell if somebody is, if there's something that's not quite right or, 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 or whatever. And he said, and if I miss three days of practice, he said, everyone can tell. Everyone can tell. There is a discipline and a, and a, that goes with the Christian life. It goes with the Christian life. And he says they're disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. We do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. Are you running with purpose in every step? Or are you playing around? Or do you say, well, I can relax a little bit. He says if we're going to make it, we're going to have to run with purpose in every step. He says I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just playing around. He says, there's purpose in what I do. Brothers and sisters, the purposes of your lives are being fulfilled now. Not just one, some point down the road when you get a little more mature. Not just some point down the road when God has a big ministry for you. God has a purpose for your life now. Are you running with purpose in every, strip, every step? He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it. He says, I don't want to be disqualified. And then in 2 Timothy 2.5, Athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. We can run hard and fast. We can do all that we want to for the Lord. But is there the discipline of the Holy Spirit? Is there the discipline of the Word in our lives that, help, that helps to make sure we're qualified before the Lord in what we do? And so the question for us as we come to this, as we think about discipline, is this. Am I willing to consider correction from the Word the Holy Spirit and Christian friends. There's, a, there's a, a question for you. Am I willing to consider it? A lot of times we get correction, we just push it away, don't we? But there's a discipline that comes if we're going to fulfill God's purposes in our lives. There must be. That's, that's part of it. That's part of it. And discipline comes to everyone. You think, hey, you think Pastor Jennifer doesn't get some correction and discipline all along? I got some yesterday while I was preparing this from the Holy Spirit. And it kind of hurt. And I had to take care of it. Why? Because I want to win the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so as we come to an end, and I know it's just a few minutes after, stay with me and we'll finish up very quickly as we come to an end. I bring us back to Eric Little this morning. And look with me at what he said. Remember what I told you to remember from the beginning. And look at what he says. This is when he won. I think this may have been when he won the, the gold medal. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Look at what he said. He said, It has been a wonderful experience to compete in the Olympic Games 
and to bring home a gold medal. But since I've been a young lad, I've had my eyes on a different prize. You see, each one of us is in a greater race than any I have run in Paris, and this race ends when God gives out the medals. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Remember what I said earlier on? I said, remember this, the devotion, the singleness of gaze. How could Eric Little live for God as he did, run those races, be a great runner, be a great student, a rugby player, and then lay it all aside one year later, lay the gold medal aside, go to China and give his life, live for God with great glory and honor and humility in the Japanese internment camp, and then give his life in that camp for God's glory. How could he do that? Because from childhood, he had the goal. From childhood, he knew, this is my goal. And because he had that goal, everything else, he could make it fit. He could make it fit. And then he says in, in the next slide, he says, many of us are missing something in life because we are after the second best. I put before you what I have found to be the best, one who's worthy of all our devotion, Jesus Christ. He's the Savior for the young and the old. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. What is your goal? What is your end? Is it the things of this world? Is it second best? Or do you have your eyes set on first? First best. First best, not second best. Come to a conclusion. The life you are called to live, dissatisfaction. Not yet. Devotion, one thing. Direction, forget the past, lean forward. Determination, press on. Discipline, live up to what we know to live up to. And on every point, every point, Jesus will be your provision for every one of these things. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for Paul way back.